Okay, so I think now I'm recording. Sorry about all the delay. Okay, so this is cell membranes and membrane transport. Welcome back to microbiology. I'm sure you're glad to be here. Um, so what is the cell membrane made out of? What purpose uh, does the cell membrane have? So why don't we start with the, the simplest part, which is the second one. What is the purpose? What job does the cell membrane do? Keeps things in. What else? Lets things out. Serves and protects, yeah? There's a lot of other jobs that it does, but insofar as we're learning about membrane transport, it lets stuff in, it lets stuff out, and it keeps stuff in, and it keeps stuff out, yeah? What is it made out of? Phospholipid bilayer, that's the primary part of it. Anything else? Proteins. Yeah, so the proteins are actually just like everywhere else that we look. The proteins are doing most of the stuff that we want to get done. Okay? So, um, there's one way in and there's one way out. Right? So, the cell has to keep the things that the cell wants to keep, to get the things the cell wants, etc., etc. And many parts of the cell membrane are working toward these major tasks. So, we have a phospholipid bilayer, we have membrane proteins, we can also have some cholesterol if we have an animal cell, prokaryotic cells don't have those, there are some carbohydrates. Um, so the phospholipid bilayer we talked about, yeah? Do you remember uh, the thought experiment we did, right? Where basically we learned through thinking about it that the, what holds the phospholipid bilayer together is the laws of physics, right? The, the interactions, the, the attraction of these polar parts to each other and to the water. And the repulsion of the hydrophobic parts to the water and their attraction to each other, right? Nonpolar likes nonpolar and as a result these things tend to uh, gravitate around each other like that. You can actually make drugs that way. Did you guys know that? Um, so you can get uh, drugs that are lipophilic and you can put your drugs or your vitamins into a phospholipid bilayer. My dad thinks that that's just the greatest thing since sliced bread and he swears that his lipo, lipospheric vitamin C is just makes the rest of the vitamin C world not even um, so, again, um, images, lipo, lipospheric, and look at that, lipospheric vitamin C, so you sell a bunch of this vitamin C, I am, this is not an endorsement, but, um, um, how about a mycel? So mycels are little blobs of phospholipids that tend to form, right? Little bilayers and little mycels are things that sort of naturally form uh, um, by, again, by the laws of physics when you get a bunch of phospholipids in the same neighborhood. You get a few, they tend to, they tend to circle the wagons, yeah? They tend to have their, their heads point out and their tails point in to make this thing called a myceal. This is a bilayer when you have a few more, yeah? Okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, phospholipids uh, do that because they're amphipathic, as we know. Um, furthermore, fatty acid saturation can influence how tightly these membranes hold together. Do you understand that? Um, so, um, you can see how tightly packed the phospholipids are here, yeah? We can see the, the tails of the phospholipids all pointing inwards. But the tails are made out of fatty acids, and fatty acids can be saturated, and they can be unsaturated, and they can be partly unsaturated. Yeah? Can you guys see that? Um, so, which of these, um, it says here, fatty acid saturation influences fluidity of cell membranes. Which of these cell membranes do you think would be the most fluid, and conversely, uh, membranes made out of which of these do you think would be the most rigid? 
Unsaturated would be fluid or rigid? Fluid. And saturated, rigid, right? How many people think that that's right? right? Again, what? that's the right answer. Had you heard that before, Anna? Or did you just guess? So you learned it already, yeah? Anyone not learn that before and just guess it? So it stands to reason, doesn't it? How, if we had all our phospholipids like this, how close together would the phospholipids be? They would be, they would be closer together, yeah? And if they were bent like this, then they'd take up more space. And the, and the phospholipid bilayer would not hold as tightly. Does that make sense? Yeah. What do we notice about saturated fats? Name a saturated fat. Butter, yeah? What else? Animal fats, yeah? Name unsaturated fats. Olive oil, yeah? And what did you say? Omega-3 fatty acids, yeah? What are, what are all the ones that you're thinking of that are unsaturated? How are they different from all the ones that are saturated? They're liquid instead of solid. And, and they tend to be healthier, yeah? So um, as far as they're being liquid instead of solid, it's because they stack more easily, yeah? As far as, as, far as why, why they do that, they tend to be sort of um, why they're, so I guess this explains why they're solid and not liquid. It doesn't explain in as much detail why one is healthier and the other, the other is unhealthier. Yeah? Um, and I don't know if Michael, if it answered your question at all. In fact, I've forgotten what your question was. Okay. Ah, yeah, so they're so harder to break down and not as good for you. Ah, yeah, as far as the mechanism by which one is not as good for you as the other. Um, so, well, that's the explanation I often give for what are called trans un, uh, unsaturated fats. Yeah, so um, one thing I'm not, and, and th these are digressions. This is not something that you'll need to know for the class, but trans fatty acids. Do you guys know any? Are trans fatty acids saturated or unsaturated? You might think that they are saturated because trans fats tend to be solids, yeah? Crisco oil is, is what we call hydrogenated oil. Um, partially hydrogenated peanut oil. When your peanut butter has been hydrogenated, all your peanut oil stuff mixes with all uh, the oils mixed with the with uh, proteins, yeah? Because there's lots of protein in peanut butter, there's lots of oil in peanut butter, yeah? Um, however, um, the reason that happens is from hydrogenation of the oils. And hydrogenated oils, um, basically, got to pull up another picture, hydrogenation is, an, is a chemical process. Now, the fact that it's a chemical process doesn't by definition, make it unhealthy. But hydrogenation. So hydrogenation is done in a big vat like this. And you take hydrogen gas, you take your olive oil, you take a little bit of nickel catalyst, and that helps the hydrogen bubbles uh, bind to your fatty acids to partially hydrogenate them. Right? And when they are hydrogenated, they go from being unsaturated to more saturated, but they become saturated in a different way. They become what are called trans fats. And trans fats are different from regular fatty acids in most of the rest of the places in your body. Right? But they are unsaturated. You see the difference between cis unsaturated and trans unsaturated? Both of them feature a double bond. But one has the double bonds on both sides. The other has it one, double, uh, one hydrogen on one side, the other on the other side. Yeah. Well, as a result of that, the shape of those molecules becomes significantly different. We can see the bend that I've got in my PowerPoint here. 
uh, the bend in the, in the unsaturated fatty acid, right? That is a cis fatty acid, a normal fatty acid. However, these trans fatty acids are straight like a saturated fatty acid. And because they're straight, they pack more easily and they tend to be more solid, just like, um, just like butter and animal fat, yeah? However, um, this, um, all of them are broken down by enzymes. We'll learn about enzymes today uh, as chapter 5, part 1. Enzymes are very specific and they, and they basically interact with their substrates in a very specific way. And, and if your enzymes have evolved to break down unsaturated fats that look like this, then it'll be so much the harder for them to get a grip on ones like this. And so, at least the story I've been told about why, um, why trans fats are so nasty, um, and the, I don't believe this story has been proven, but this is a story that I, it sort of stands to my reason, um, is that if there are no enzymes to break down a trans fat, it's more likely to accumulate in your body, right? As far as why saturated fats are more unhealthy, perhaps the fact that um, atherosclerosis uh, usually involves the hardening of arteries, the accumulation of fatty deposits in the arteries. If these things stack more easily, they might stack more easily inside your arteries, yeah? Um, so again, that I think you better not take that to the bank. That's what I've heard, but those, that's not a scientific fact, yeah? Okay? All right. So we are well beyond my knowledge. I'm so relieved that I don't teach nutrition because I think the knowledge that's required for nutrition doesn't exist to really, you can't even tell people what's healthy or not. Anyway, so cholesterol in animal membranes can stabilize the fluidity. So along with the chemical composition, whether you've got saturated or unsaturated fats in your, in your membranes, that's one factor that determines fluidity. Another thing that determines fluidity is temperature. Um, <clears throat> another thing is whether you have um, these uh, uh, cholesterol molecules in there. And if you do, um, Flu fluidity becomes more stable across temperature. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, proteins comprise about 45% of cell membranes. We talked about how it's a fluid mosaic that's selectively permeable. Um, proteins assist in allowing things to pass in and out. Um, and they do a lot of other things too, right? Um, the, the jobs of a cell membrane protein are, are really important. Cell signaling, right? This, if we see this little orange teardrop-shaped molecule, this is a signaling molecule. This could be a steroid or a, or a hormone-like insulin, right? If, if the cell picks it up, the cell will be told, hey, it's time to grab sugar out of the body. If this is, if this is insulin, binding of a membrane protein, a receptor protein, will tell that cell what to do. Does that make sense? Right? So... Um, Membranes, membrane proteins allow cells to receive communications, and that's a very important thing that, that cell membranes do. Another thing cell membranes do is they allow cells to recognize each other. This cell here can tell whether this cell below is a friend or a foe based on the carbohydrates, these little hexagons, the little green hexagons here. Um, uh, um, on the surface of this protein, yeah? And if these proteins fit what this cell above expects, then this cell says, oh, you're a friend, you belong here, yeah? And if not, well, this cell might say, you're an enemy, I'm going to sound the alarm, and I'm going to bring all of the immune powers of your immune system to bear against this invading cell. Does that make sense? Right? So looking at the surfaces of cells of a multicellular person like you allows, allows your white blood cells, such as this one might be above, to attack ones below. Are you convinced? Do you understand? Do you see a mechanism how this, the cell on top can recognize the cell on the bottom? 
effectively, it's by Braille, yeah? You guys, everyone knows what Braille is, yeah? Right? You know, it, touching to get information, yeah? Blind people read by Braille, yeah? Braille? You guys know what Braille is? I just explained it. It's books, Braille books are books that have bumps in them, and blind people touch the bumps and they can read the letters, yeah? Um, likewise, this cell has carbohydrate bumps on it, yeah? All cells, not just particular cells, but pretty much all cells around have carbohydrate bumps on those cells, right? Um, your immune cells, what are their, what's their job? Your immune system, what does it do? Protects you from pathogens that invade you, yeah? It protects you from invaders, right? Well, how can you tell if this cell is an invader? Well, the cops, when they pull me over, they know I'm not an invader by showing my driver's license, showing my ID, yeah? Likewise, your body has familiar patterns that it makes on its cells, yeah? That serve as ID badges, yeah? These cells are ready to recognize familiar patterns and ready to sound the alarm about unfamiliar patterns. Is that clear? All right. So that's another thing cell membrane proteins do, is they give away who you are to the immune system that wants to know, and they allow the, the uh, white blood cells to suss out those that don't belong here. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. Also here, letter E, intracellular joining, right? Your tissues are held together by proteins that bind together, yeah? Um, and that's another job that membrane proteins do in multicellular cells, right? But the most important thing that we care about now is this letter D, transport, right? Here we can see little blue balls coming into the cell. Why do they come into the cell? Because this channel, this transport protein, lets them in. Yeah? And as it turns out, there's lots of channel proteins that let in various things or spend effort to, to proactively pull things into the cell or to expel things from the cell or to let things leak out of the cell. Okay? So, let's look at the way things can enter or leave the cell. Okay? Um, we've got diffusion, osmosis, we've got active transport. Any questions before we start? You guys ready? How many people have heard this kind of stuff before? A lot of you. All right. Anyone not heard this stuff before? Nobody's raising their hands. I'll go quickly. You stop me if you have questions, okay? So, um, uh, three basic ways. Diffusion, osmosis, active transport. Within diffusion, we have passive diffusion. We have facilitated diffusion. So, diffusion is the movement of substances uh, from a high concentration to a low concentration. Everyone understand that? So, that means um, uh, so that things will start from a high concentration. They'll diffuse to a low concentration. What happens next? We reach equilibrium. But the equilibrium is... Um, so these molecules are sort of bouncing around. Are the molecules alive? No, they're just molecules, yeah? And molecules, they're just bouncing around by their own vibrations causing them to bump into each other, and they're bumping into each other causing them to spread apart, yeah? These could be molecules of an orange, right? And if you peel the orange, somebody else can smell the orange because the smelly molecules of orange diffuse from a high concentration of smelly orange particles around the orange to a low concentration in your nose. And when they go into your nose, then the little molecules act like little receptors and tell your brain, oh, there's orange there. Does that make sense? And that's how you smell, right? That is effectively, back to our picture of cell membranes, that's what's happening here. This little orange wedge is a molecule of an orange, perhaps, and it's telling a neuron, a sensory neuron in your nose, that there's orange there, yeah? And you, it says, oh, we've detected orange in the area. Tell the brain, quickly. And then the brain says, oh my goodness, there's orange. How do I get a slice? Yeah? 
Okay, so, but once those molecules, whether they're orange particles or whatever they are, whatever smell they are, or whatever particle they are in a liquid or a fluid, they don't stop moving once they reach equilibrium. They diffuse until an equilibrium is reached, yeah? But once that equilibrium is reached, they don't stop moving. The equilibrium is dynamic, right? And that means that molecules from the left will go to the right, but they're roughly balanced out from the ones on the right going to the left. They continue to bounce around. Okay. So, membranes can change the way diffusion works, right? We can expect that diffusion, um, diffusion does not require a membrane. Diffusion is a law, is a force. It happens, yeah? Um, but if there's a membrane in the way, that force can be influenced by that membrane, yeah? So, um, we've got molecules of dye. They're all on the left side. There is a membrane. And the membrane has gaps here. What are these gaps? They're little holes or pores, yeah? And what's happening, looks like the molecules of dye are moving through the membrane until equilibrium is reached, yeah? Um, so, how fast does this happen? Whatever, however fast it happens, there are some factors that influence it, yeah? On what properties of dye and membrane does the rate of diffusion depend? Temperature, right? Temperature is effectively molecular kinetic energy. Did you guys know that? The hotter things are, the faster the molecules of those things tend to bounce around. Hopefully everybody knows that, yeah? And if you didn't, I just said it, and hopefully you can re remember that, right? So, if these molecules are bouncing, fast, bouncing around faster because the temperature is higher, that is what temperature is. If they are bouncing around faster, what would we expect? They would be more likely to bounce by luck through one of the holes, yeah? And therefore, they would diffuse faster than if they were bouncing around slower. You agree? All right, what else? The concentration. The more little dye molecules, the more likely per unit time that one particular molecule will find its way through one of the holes. You agree? Anything else? Pressure, sure. If there was pressure, that would, the pressure would tend to force things across. Anything else? pH? Depending on whether there was a pH disparity and whether these guys had a chemical affinity or solubility based on certain pH, that might matter too, yeah? How about the size of the holes? Does that matter? That's maybe, maybe was so obvious people didn't bother to consider it, yeah? And it's, it appears to be fixed in the picture. But if the holes are bigger, what? Molecules diffuse faster. And if the holes are smaller, they diffuse more slowly or not at all, yeah? What would happen if the holes were smaller than the molecules? Dif diffusion would stop, yeah? Okay. All right. What if you have two different kinds of molecules? Well, if that's the case, then the molecules on the left and the molecules on the right ignore each other. They pay each other no mind. We have a high concentration of blue dots on the left. We have a, a high concentration of red dots on the right. The fact that there's a higher concentration of blue dots does not influence the diffusion of the red dots. Does that make sense? Right? The red dots follow their own concentration gradient, yeah? And if there's a high concentration of, of red dots on this side and a low concentration of red dots on this side, it doesn't matter that there's a high concentration of blue dots. The blue dots don't stop the red dots. Only a higher concentration of red dots on this side can stop the red dots from moving, okay? You guys got that? All right. And then both will reach their own equilibrium or each will reach their own equilibrium. Oops, what just happened? Whoa. Control minus, there we go. Phew, that was close. All right, the cell membrane uh, occasionally can have molecules that can pass through the phospholipid bilayer on their own, yeah? 
the molecules of the phospholipid bilayer are, are simple. They are phospholipids, and if things can wiggle through, then there's nothing the cell can do about it, okay? So um, small, generally nonpolar molecules can pass through very easily through the phospholipid bilayer. That includes oxygen, carbon dioxide, alcohol, steroids, gasoline. All of these are variously small. Some are smaller than others, um, but uh, uh, these are all mostly nonpolar. Alcohol has some polarity. Um, water is polar, but very small. It can pass through membranes at very low rates, and I should say very low. Um, uh, are we good here? Questions? Um, so, so much for simple diffusion. Simple diffusion, again, there's no control and there's no effort required, yeah? Does that make sense? Um, all right, facilitated diffusion also has no effort required um, and little control, but some control. So this allows passage of desirable molecules. Um, if we have a high concentration or, and I, it says desirable, or big, yeah? or big and or yeah so if we have a molecule outside the cell in a high concentration we have a low concentration inside the cell if this molecule is too big to fit through the phospholipid bilayer we'll never get it unless we have a channel protein so this channel protein is something that the cell has evolved just for letting this particular substance, whatever these yellow balls are, it's just for letting this substance in, right? Um, membrane proteins allow ions and small molecules to pass in and out. Potassium ions are charged. They are small, but they're charged, and there are proteins that let them in. Sodium ions, sugars, have transporters that let them in, yeah? All right. Um, is energy required? Energy is not required. There was, it took energy to build the channel in the first place, yeah? So building the channel required energy. But once the channel is built, it's a hole, yeah? And things will pass through the hole from a high concentration to a low concentration. However, if it's a protein, we can build a doorway into that hole, yeah? And the doorway can be opened or closed, yeah? And opening the doorway and closing the doorway, that might cost a little energy. You guys following me? Right? But once the doorway is open, the fluid can pass through according to its concentration gradient. Does that make sense? If someone, if someone rips one in the class, yeah? And there's a horrible smell filling the class, right? And the door is closed, right? then there's a high concentration inside the classroom. It takes effort to open the door. But once the door is opened, the horrible funk can diffuse from the high concentration inside to outside without effort. Is that clear? Okay. All right, so much for diffusion. Now let's look at the diffusion of water. Um, diffusion of water uh, across selectively permeable membranes requires no energy. Water moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. Water can pass through membranes, and water, um, as it turns out, uh, has, the cell has very little control in most cases over this, yeah? Okay, so osmosis is the diffusion of water. Um, we've got, uh, so we've got a little system here. And I've got a couple of things here. I've got sugar molecules in red. And what about um, in blue here? Water molecules. All right. Anything else? This is just a sugar water solution. Yeah? So if that's the case, then we understand it's a zero-sum game. Yeah? The more sugar we have by percent, what? the less water we have. Does that make sense? So if this is 20% sugar, then what? Got to be 80% water. 
And if this is 5% sugar, then it's got to be what? 95% water, yeah? So, what happens? What can we infer about the permeability of the membrane? Sugar cannot pass through, yeah? And water, what about water? Water can pass through. And so, because water can, it does. Because sugar can't, it doesn't. And why can't sugar pass through? Maybe the holes are too small and the sugar molecules are too big, yeah? Sure, that, that's, that could be, yeah? All right, and if that happens, the water moves across, defying gravity, yeah? This water is going against gravity. It's, it's, isn't that weird? Right? Gravity should be pulling harder on this side than this side, and it should be, yeah? And it is. And yet, the force of osmosis, at least from this picture to this picture, is stronger than the force of gravity. Does that make sense? We have two competing forces, and we have reached equilibrium in this picture, yeah? The force of gravity pulling down and the force of osmosis pushing up um, are equal. Right? Same here, yeah? So, <clears throat> so if this is, if this is, if these volumes are equal, yeah? And this is 90% water, 10% sugar, And this is 80% water, 20% sugar. What do you think? What do you think would happen? Yeah, I guess we would expect on each side of this about 85%, yeah? It might not be exactly that because, again, the force of gravity pushing down here is stronger. So maybe this would be 85.1, and this would be 84.9. Does that make sense? You guys with me there in terms of percent water? Or I guess this would be 84.9, this would be 85.1. I'm confused already. Anyway, I think I had it right the first time. Okay, thank you. You get the idea. The forces are in equilibrium, and, and gravity has its say, but, but equilibrium is reached. All right, so when only water can pass, osmosis can cause a cell to shrivel or to swell. Yeah? Okay, so I think this is, is this worth discussing? Do we want to we wanna project what's going on here? Um, I, th I think uh, a couple of little bits of problem solving are probably worth doing, yeah? Okay, so I've got some water. Where's my blue pen? There's my water. And I've got a cell, okay? According to this, um, the cell is about 2% cell content, yeah? So I've got 2% cell. 98% water. What about outside? Imagine I've got um, imagine I've got 100% water here. What will happen? Imagine, let's, let's change it around. What if I have 90% water, 10% sugar? What happens? Water will go out of the cell until what? Until we get equilibrium, yeah? So we can achieve equilibrium here, and the water diffuses out until the water goes down to about 90%, yeah? So what does the cell look like after this has happened? It shrivels up. It's just lost 8% of its volume, yeah? Does that make sense? Okay, and 
Now it looks all shriveled and pathetic. Oh, that's a, that's a poor cell. All right. So imagine then that we switch these numbers around, right? Imagine now this is 100% water, right? The usual explanation is that we've got a dehydrated patient in the OR. Quick, let's get him an IV of some water. Why is that a bad idea? So we can predict what's going to happen, yeah? 100% water, this is 98%, yeah? Where's the high concentration of water? Outside, 100 is greater than 98, yeah? Okay, so what happens? Water goes in, yeah? Water goes in, and then what? Well, this is maybe 99% now, yeah? And what has happened to the cell when we've gone from 98% water to 99% water? Swells. By how much? You might think 1%. It would be like doubling in size, yeah? Because the amount of cell contents has gone from 2% down to 1%, yeah? In order to go from 2% to 1%, I have to nearly double the amount of water. Does that make sense? You guys with me there? Right? So it's just doubled in size. Can it do that? Probably not. Um, once it, if it did do it, would, would equilibrium be reached? Can this cell reach equilibrium? Yes or no? How is it going to reach equilibrium with 100% water? It would have to be 100% water to reach equilibrium, yeah? And what's 100% water? Just water, right? Can a cell ever be 100% water? A cell can never be 100% water because only water can be 100% water, yeah? Does that make sense? Right? So it will, it will never reach equilibrium, yeah? What will happen? Will it burst? You would think it would burst, yeah? So um, basically, there's two possible outcomes when I get a balloon and try, to, and try to blow it up. So I've got a balloon. I blow it up. I reach its maximum inflation, but I keep blowing, right? There's two outcomes, yeah? What's one outcome? when I keep blowing into the balloon. The, the balloon bursts, yeah? Does that make sense? What's the other possible outcome? It pushes back on me and I pass out trying to blow it up, yeah? And I fail to explode it. Does that make sense? So the two different outcomes depend on what? The strength of the membrane of the balloon, yeah? Against what? The force of my lungs to pop the balloon, yeah? And if my lungs are stronger, what? Then I win and the balloon pops. And if the, the membrane of the balloon is stronger, then I lose, yeah? And the, the, the cell retains its strength, yeah? Well, in the case of human red blood cells, which is stronger, the force of osmosis or the strength of the membrane that holds that cell together? In the case of the human red blood cell, it happens to be the force of osmosis, right? And so it's a really bad idea to give somebody an IV of pure water because you'll lice their cells, yeah? What about a bacterium? If I take E. coli bacterium and I put them into distilled water, do they burst? Why not? That's the correct answer. They don't. They have a cell wall. And that cell wall reinforces that membrane and backs up the membrane and is stronger than the force of osmosis. Does that make sense? You guys got that? Okay, so whether the cell pops, what if, what if I have a gram positive cell and I put a bunch of penicillin in there? Then what happens to those cells? They burst, why? So that penicillin breaks down the cell wall. There's no cell wall. There's no protection for the cell membrane inside, and the cell bursts. Yeah? You guys got it? All right. Right? If, 
if the cell wall is strong, it contains the swelling. If the cell wall is weak or damaged, the cell bursts by osmotic lysis. You guys understand osmotic lysis now, yeah? You understand weak or damaged now from antibiotics or from lysozyme. Yeah, remember lysozyme? Okay, good. Active trans, so much for osmosis. We're done, yeah? Active transport. Active transport is where substances are moved by the cell from a low concentration to a high concentration. Yeah? Questions? This requires energy. We move against a concentration gradient. In this picture, how is that energy spent? ATP. We have a purple squares. We have a few purple squares out of the cell. We have a lot of purple squares in the cell. We want to move more purple squares into the cell against that concentration gradient. We have to spend energy, and that energy usually comes from ATP. All right. So a couple other things. Active transport for very large things. Um, we can do... We can do cell phagocytosis. We've talked about this already, yeah? All right, phagocytosis is cell swallowing up, right? And do I have a picture of that? Didn't I have a nice picture of that that I gave you guys? Let me see. No, that's as nice as I got. Okay, so we can see phagocytosis. I guess this isn't as good as I'd like, but it's decent, yeah? We swallow up bacteria. And then we can fuse those bacteria with a lysosome and then bye-bye bacteria, yeah? Okay. Likewise, we have neurotransmitters or chemical hormones or something. Maybe this is coming from the Golgi, right? And it's been modified for export. And then we, bloop, we export it, yeah? That's exocytosis. All right. Is that good? So I have 1040. Do you guys want to take a 10-minute break? Okay, we'll come back.